Well, I, <clears throat> when I was a kid, uh, we lived at the foot of Felton Street, which dead ends on the on a canyon. Mm -hmm. And I used to play around the canyon with some other kids. And our play was building forts, and and in, in the winter when the soil was muddy or wet, you could pull up big hunks of grass, and we had forts, and we threw grass at <laughs> each other. Yeah. That's one of my earliest memories. Uh, but I always really enjoyed uh, the canyon. It's at the foot of Felton Street, and it's been built up quite a bit since then. I had some interesting experiences when I was five years old, for example. I was playing with matches on the edge of the canyon in the summer, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, those boys will do that. They, I lit some grass on fire, and it kept spraying and spraying. I tried to stomp it out with this other little boy who was with me, and we didn't manage to stomp it all out. It ended up burning about an acre. Wow! And uh, so we ran home, and uh, about. Six o'clock in the evening, there was a knock on the door. It was these giant men in black. <laughs> they were firemen. <laughs> and they said uh, to my father, uh, we, we heard that your son was involved in this fire on, on the canyon edge. And uh, my father, I was hiding in my room because I knew who they were. <laughs> and my father came into the, the, the room and he said, did you out of fire in the canyon? I said, no. <laughs> yeah, and then he went out to the fireman and said, my son never lies, and if he said he didn't do it, he didn't do it, so they went away. <laughs> they probably knew that. Yeah, right. They what they can do with a five-year-old kid. Sure. <laughs> so, so that was one of my first memories of the canyons in San Diego. In uh, high school, I had a biology teacher who knew of my interests, and he said, you know, Michael, there's, um, there's a bunch of kids who hang out at the Natural History Museum. You should go down there and check it out. So I did, and I fell in with these, these young, young amateur biologists who were, uh, went on field trips mm -hmm. and uh, were interested in natural history. So that, you know, I just took off from there and just, right. just uh, and we'd drive around in the back country in spring looking for amphibians on the road after a rain. And uh, the couple in the back seat usually made out, which was <laughs> very, it wasn't very serious right. by today's standards, right. of making out. We snuggled and kissed a little bit. Right. And so, and, but I had a very free, free childhood and, and adolescence. It was, and San Diego was was wonderful. It had a lot, a lot of natural history. We visited the Borrego, and we'd go up in the mountains in different seasons, and, mm -hmm. and went over to the coast and, and collected a, the extra low tides in January or so. Yeah, and uh, really just spent spent a lot of time just being a naturalist as a kid. We played this game. Uh, we'd be driving around in the back country of San Diego, uh, and um, uh, we taught each other scientific nomenclature by because you know how 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 uh, competitive kids can be. Yeah. And so we uh, had this game of trying to look as far beyond the uh, as far ahead on the road as we can see yeah. and give the Latin shout out the Latin names of every plant and animal we can mm -hmm. see before somebody else shouted them. Right, right. So we taught each other a lot of natural history and taxonomy just because we were competitive kids. We were always collecting stuff. And the way we collect kangaroo rats we uh, we had people on each front fender, mm -hmm. trucks had fenders, yeah. and, and we'd see a kangaroo rat, we'd wait to the driver to stop, so we'd, as, even before the chop, we'd rat, we jumped off and 
man with a with a, a, a baseball caps and scooped them up. My my junior naturalist friends at the museum, uh, we we would go down to Baja. Mm -hmm. Our parents, you know, didn't like it so much, but mm -hmm. it was perfectly safe. Yeah, and we we took our food down there. Mostly we went down this to Santa Tomas or around that area south of Ensenada, mm -hmm. and uh, explored, collected, collected stuff for the museum. Mm -hmm. Later on, I collected for the California Academy of Sciences in that photograph. Yeah, yeah. And it's one of those trips. Mm -hmm. So I was in the right place at the right time to be a naturalist. And during that, of course, I became interested in the field of ecology. Yeah. And which nobody had ever heard of in those days. Right. But I said, when I heard about ecology, I said, you mean you can get a job <laughs> doing <laughs> all this fun thing, going on field trips, yeah. going to Baja? Right. I said, that's for me. Paul Ehrlich had just come to Stanford, and uh, he had sort of found the field of population biology. So later on, when I was starting to be an academic, I was saying, well, you know, I'm interested in conservation, but I don't know what to call the field. And then I said, population conservation biology. So I, mm -hmm. I dreamt it up in the shower. Well, <clears throat> on my, I've always been uh, an advocate, interested in advocacy and conservation. I mean, I, as a founder of the field of conservation biology, so naturally, uh, I consider it almost irresponsible for a biologist not to be a conservationist because we're we're losing the, we're losing nature all over the world so fast, and so I, I think it's almost an obligation of biologists to be conservation biologists. Yeah, though a lot of people don't agree with. Yeah. And I think science and advocacy should be separate. But, you know, I, I believe there was, a, there's a, there was a, a, an Asian conservationist who said, we only say what we love. Yeah. So the idea of loving nature is, uh, I've always identified with that because uh, we don't want to save things we don't care about. The there's a sense of urgency, but there's also the, the need to be objective. Yeah. So science uh, is a, is a uh, an inconvenient bedfellow of advocacy. Mm -hmm. uh, but a person can be both. Mm -hmm. a, a person can be scientifically objective in, in their science work, but then also some kind of put on their conservation hats. Well, I love these creatures. That's why I work on them. Mm -hmm. uh, and admit it. Yeah. I, you know, for a while it was not. It was not. It was it was infra dig. It was beneath your dignity to, uh, as a scientist, to espouse uh, affection mm -hmm. for nature mm -hmm. and particular creatures. I think I think now that that's that's no longer the case as much anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, partly because we've, we're losing so much so fast, mm -hmm. and it's really up to scientists to encourage people to protect nature. I was working in the canyons, mm -hmm. trying to figure out what something to do in the canyons. With I had some, I was between jobs, and I but I had these students from uh, and uh, I, from San Diego, from UC San Diego that I had corralled. Mm -hmm. I said, well, let's let's do let's start looking at the canyons and seeing uh, how many bird species there are in different canyons and seeing if there are any patterns. I was interested in island biogeography. Sure. Yeah. So the canyons are islands yeah. in the sea of development. And uh, so uh, I realized that uh, the major pattern was in canyons with access to coyotes, there were a lot more birds. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, having grown up in San Diego, I knew why in the cats. Right. But students, I said, Here's the, here's the data. Here's the number of bird species in, in these 30 different canyons. 
do you see any patterns? And the students didn't. Uh, but I said, uh, think about uh, why there would be birds in some canyons and hardly any birds in other canyons. And the canyon that was the, the key was in Loma Portal, I think. Uh, and there was a canyon there with no birds. Mm -hmm. And and uh, but cat shit everywhere. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. So you know it became very clear that uh, when you had predators without a predator on the predator, yeah, coyotes in this case, right. that uh, the, the, the keystone species was uh, uh, was the coyote. Yeah. And whether, whether it was coyotes, things were fine. Yeah. Biologically, right. without coyotes, they, they, things fell apart. Yeah. And so that's when I got into this carnivore thing mm -hmm. and the important role that carnivores play. It was counterintuitive to a lot of people. So why would carnivores, which eat other things, eat creatures, uh, be protecting the system? Yeah. And yeah. Because they eat the mesopredators, which do more damage than the top predators. Right. Well, it's, it's obvious that <clears throat> if you create a barrier to the movement of, uh, of carnivores and uh, herbivores and, and other, and even birds. Birds need habitat, and the habitat has to be continuous more or less. Mm -hmm. It can be slightly discontinuous depending on the species. That you're going to lose a lot of biodiversity, but you know, the current administration doesn't care anything yeah. about nature. Uh, so uh, yeah, border wall is absurd and horribly dangerous in terms of protecting nature, but uh, a lot of people don't care about nature. <laughs> yeah, I like the phrase. <laughs> I, thought, I thought, well, you know, traditional mainstream conventional ecology is not saving the world. Yeah. And it's partly because there are so many forces opposed to it, including development. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, so mainstream conventional ecology is not protecting nature. So what's left? Well, we have to be more sneaky. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, for example, uh, when if, if wolves have become extinct recently in the Northeast, uh, what can we do about it? Well, throw up our hands, that's, uh, that's legal. Uh, <laughs> but, but helping wolves get back to places, or coyotes, mm -hmm. get back to places where they're needed to maintain nature, uh, may not be legal, but it's not officially illegal either. <laughs> it's a little subversive. Right. Yeah. So I, uh, I think that that kind of uh, unorthodox maybe, uh, ecology is called for. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I'm working with a colleague to uh, have a conference on subversive ecology to popularize the idea that it's okay if, if even if the government won't support the idea of introducing or reintroducing coyotes and wolves and whatever, to a place, it can happen anyway. Mm -hmm. It's just that it can't happen officially. Right. <laughs> so you do it unofficially. Right. The problem with academia is that academics care by almost must care more about tenure and promotion than anything else. Mm -hmm. I mean, unless you get tenure, you. you don't have a job, and it's going to be hard to get it done. The job, yeah. So, uh, but it can go too far. I think the Journal for, for Conservation, I was just reading right, the recent issue. Uh, it's much too cautious. Mm -hmm. Conservationists, conservation biologists, are much too careful, mm -hmm. uh, not uh, going against the rules of academic life, which is total objectivity. You're not supposed to love things mm -hmm. that you study, uh, because then you're not objective. Right. So I think it's too late to be objective. Yeah. That 
we have to be passionate, mm-hmm. and and we have to say. I tell my I told my students even when I was still teaching that we must love nature. Mm-hmm. It's not enough to uh, study it. I I I coined a phrase once that that facts compute, but they don't convert. Mm-hmm. Only mm-hmm. passion converts other people to your way of thinking. It can, that can be good and bad, right. depending on what you're passionate about. Right. Yeah. But yeah, yeah I, I, I strongly believe that, we, that it's too late to not be openly and effectively passionate, mm-hmm. and that, which means not objective. You know, optimism is vastly overrated. <laughs> We don't need to be optimistic. We just need. To, we just don't. We just can't give up. Never mm-hmm. give up. The, the Dalai Lama has this famous, not a poem, but a statement about never giving up. He's talking about helping the Buddhists get back into Tibet. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Tibetan Buddhists go home, but and he says, you know, whatever happens, never give up. And he repeats it again. Mm-hmm. And it's not rational, right? But there's a time for rationality, a time to let go of rationality, and, and just operate out of hope and love and faith. <laughs>